a good couple of 20 minute efforts into every ride that they're doing um and then have one day then where they're just doing the bigger mileage um and and just getting that zone two ride in um and and yeah building on on time on the bike basically the triathlon show episode 88 Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I talk to fellow Scandinavian and fellow Swedish-speaking coach Magnus Maggi Beckstedt. He's a former road cyclist and, among other achievements, a Paris-Roubaix winner. And uh, did you know, by the way, that about me, that I'm Swedish speaking and not Finnish speaking? I'm not sure I've been talking about that before on the podcast, but that's the fact. Uh, Swedish is a minority language, an official language in Finland. So there, you may have learned something new today. Anyway, I talked to Magnus Beckstedt and we discuss things like indoor versus outdoor cycling for triathletes, the intensity versus volume debate, Maybe it's not one or the other. Anyway, we'll hear Magnus take on the two variables of training. How important are power meters really? And can you get by on just heart rate if you don't have one? We get into mistakes that triathletes typically make in their bike training. And finally, one very, very interesting thing is we discuss what Magnus did in his swimming and running when he got into age group triathlon after his professional cycling career, uh, quite a bit after, I believe. But he became very competitive and qualified for Kona within eight months of starting out. And as you'll hear, it isn't because he was some kind of supernatural at swimming or running, but just hearing his approach and what he used and how you can apply his learnings is something that I think will be very useful for you. But first, this episode is sponsored by Precision Hydration. They provide great tasting electrolyte drinks to match your individual needs because one size does not fit all when it comes to hydration and when it comes to sweat sodium losses specifically. Their drinks prevent cramps, they enable you to get the best out of your performance and did I say that they taste great? As a personal anecdote, I just got a big box of PH products that didn't fit in my luggage when I moved here to Lisbon from Helsinki back in October when a friend came to visit here and brought this precision hydration pack with them and I must say it felt like Christmas to get a whole new pack of of pH electrolyte products because I go through a lot of it with long rides on both Saturdays and Sundays on weekends and it's a very important part for me in for performing in my workouts so uh, definitely I was happy about that anyway check them out on precisionhydration.com take their free sweat test to get your personalized hydration strategy and if you want to buy any other products use the discount code that triathlon show all one word for 15% off now just a quick bio about magnus his name, his full name is Magnus Beckstedt. As I said, he is a cycling and triathlon coach from Sweden living in the UK. He's the head coach and founder of Beckstedt Coaching. But from his road cycling days, he has achievements like in 2004 winning the Paris Roubaix. He has won stages of the Tour de France, of the Giro d'Italia, and he's a Swedish national road race cha- champion. And uh, as I mentioned, he has qualified for Kona and now coaches both cyclists and triathletes and does bike fitting. Big shout outs and thank yous to loyal listeners of the show, Chris Massey, who is uh, coached by Maggie, and he set up this interview or, or helped set up this interview. He connected the two of us. And I really, really appreciate that since I didn't know of, uh, of Magnus from before. And uh, I really, really think that this was a great discussion and one of the interviews that I've done recently that I've learned the most from and and got really a lot out of. So big thanks, uh, Chris, for that. So And also to Dan Mew, that's the other thank you and shout out I want to make. He sent in some questions that you'll hear towards the end of this interview for Magnus to answer. And just to give you a heads up about that, I sometimes post on Facebook before doing an interview if I want listener questions. And that's what I did in this case. And Dan responded to that Facebook post. 
So you can go and like Scientific Triathlon on Facebook and that will, among other things, give you the opportunity to ask questions of great guests in the future. But obviously you'll, of course, get to know about all new episodes when they are released and some other cool stuff. And you can post there yourself if you want to. So enough of the chit chat. Let's hear the interview with Magnus Beckstedt. All right, so today on That Triathlon Show, I'm very happy to welcome Magnus Beckstedt. Uh, welcome, Magnus, or Maggie, as you're called. How, how's it going? Very good, thank you. Very good. What, what have you been up to? You're in the UK now, li- living there, and uh, you've been doing some coaching or uh, cycling. How's, how's your day been so far? Uh, well, it's been it's been pretty good. I mean, I've been living over here in the UK now since uh, go to 2004, I think it was, just after I won Paris Roubaix. Um, and yeah, I, I keep keep myself busy with uh, commentating, uh, coaching a lot of people. Um, I had a couple of years when I was doing Ironman triathlons as well, just after my uh, sort of second retirement of uh, in in the cycling career. Uh, and yeah, it's just uh, just been very very interesting over the last uh, two years now, really, of just coaching cyclists and and triathletes, really. Yeah, we'll get into that. That's very interesting that you got into Ironman and very successfully. So, uh, one thing to mention is that you're actually coaching one uh, the listener of the show that uh, that tipped me off to to get you on the show, Chris. So, so that was uh, a fun piece of of trivia that I thought is worth <laughs> mentioning. But what we've been thinking of for this interview is basically to talk about bike training for triathletes because you have uh, obviously a very uh, very good professional cycling career behind you so you know a lot about cycling but then you have that that triathlon career as well and have been coaching triathletes so so a very broad perspective on on this topic so let's start with one of the most common questions this time of year especially now we're, that we're heading into winter what's your take on indoor compared to outdoor cycling for triathletes well, I think um, as any cyclist, whether you're a triathlete or whether you're a road cyclist, this time of the year, with uh, certainly if you're living up in sort of northern part of Europe, then I think you just got to use common sense to start off with. Um, if it's you know if it's icy outside or if it's below minus degrees, then don't take your road bike out there and get caught out on some black ice or something like that and end up injuring yourself just for the fact of you have to get out on the road for for x amount of time um there are so many things that you can do on an on an indoor trainer um in in one way or another to uh, still progress and and still uh, at least maintain the, the the fitness level that that you have without taking the risk of getting injured because let's face it if you're a triathlete and uh, you come down on some ice and you hurt your shoulder that's going to set you back pretty significantly with your swimming going forward and and may even uh, seriously hamper the rest of your career as a, as a triathlete so um, you know I, I i believe that you can do an awful lot of good work um on an indoor trainer if uh, if you have to do you have a, an opinion on whether it's even more effective or do you think that both are needed in a certain proportions because i know there are a lot of people that do all of their training indoors and a lot of people that are proponents of doing it because it's so effective and can be so effective but then we also have uh, the principles of specificity come into play when you are going to be racing outside and that sort of thing so how would you on from a long-term perspective over a season for example uh, consider the, the relative importance of indoor and outdoor cycling training i mean um Indoor training, you can always have a much more um, regulated type of effort. You know, it's it's quantifiable. It's um, it's always going to be twenty minutes. It's always going to be twenty minutes, and and you can you can press on as hard as you should be doing for that without any kind of restriction. So it's a lot more controllable to to run on an indoor trainer. But as far as I I'm concerned, um, cycling should be done outdoors. I love going outdoors and i think most people who ride bikes love riding the bikes outdoors um so going just doing all your intervals all your bike training on an indoor trainer i don't think that's gonna necessarily get you the feel for what is actually needed to be done outdoors because there's so many variables that you have to take into account 
um, even during an Ironman, and a certain amount of, of technique training coming into play as well. So um, there are very few corners that you have to deal with on a turbo trainer, obviously. Uh, whereas when you're at racing, you've got to deal with those kind of things. So um, I'm much more of an advocate for doing outdoor training in real um, real life scenarios. And uh, most of us have got, uh, you know, uh, roads and certain stretches of roads where you can do your intervals on uh, relatively uh, sort of um, undisturbed and, um, and, and keep it still as, as a sort of controlled an effort as you can possibly make it but still getting that nice feeling of being outside so when you coach an athlete would you have periods of the season when you get more closer to the race season that uh, they don't have any indoor training at all or would they usually still have maybe one workout per week that they do on the indoor trainer um it, it, it very much depends on the athlete um and and if the, if an athlete is happy to spend time on an indoor trainer then then I'd I'd go and and sort of prescribe that type of an effort for them to uh to, to do if you are like me who um after too many injuries throughout my cycling season absolutely detest sitting on an indoor trainer um then you know you, you got to take that into account because if an athlete is not happy they're not going to perform whether it's training or racing so you got to make sure that the athlete I, i i think anyway is is happy mentally stimulated and and enjoys the training and that's when you get the maximum out of the training so uh, i think every case is 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 so different every individual is exactly that an individual so you have to you have to really make sure that you understand and know the the, the people that you you coach um and and uh, and work with them in, in to, to to get the maximum out of them right uh, let's move on to the next question that i have for you here and that's about the intensity versus volume discussion um mm -hmm. versus is probably the the wrong word because it's not one or the other necessarily but but where do you stand on that spectrum what, what are your thoughts on that topic um you always need the volume to to make you be able to do the distances that you need to do certainly if you're doing ironmans and and longer distance races um but at the same time just riding, riding around and and doing uh, very little intensity is is not going to be ideal either so um i i tend to sort of bring the the cycling uh, type of of uh, road cycling type of of training into even triathlon and ironman triathlon at that at this point in time um and you know if you got to do four and a half um hours on a, on an ironman um course or five hours or whatever it is then um you still need to do the do that mileage do those hours and you might as well put the efforts in whilst you're out doing it rather than sitting there doing junk miles and i think there are too many especially triathletes who go out and just ride the distance at a uh, at a sort of highish or medium intensity which really doesn't do an awful lot for you because by the time you end up in that medium intensity they kind of do everything every training or a lot of their training in in the sort of um ironman pace kind of uh, uh level then that's just breaking your body down all the time i think you need to be uh, make sure that you have a distinction between the recovery part of your ride and the intensity part of your ride and with that you'll move your threshold higher um and you'll also be f fresher and and recover better for for the following day's efforts You mentioned junk miles there, and and what's uh, how do you define junk miles? Uh, is there uh, such a thing as too low an intensity? And uh, on, for example, long rides, even though we just talked about uh, doing things at a moderate intensity, not necessarily being good either. Can you go into that a bit? Yeah, um, I mean, junk miles to me is just when you actually go out and just sit on the bike. Um, if you're going too easy, then obviously you're not going to get you're not going to get the benefit of the training. Uh, what I find most people are doing, both both in cycling and in in uh, in uh, triathlon, is that they go that sort of medium pace where um, where you sort of um, you're going too hard to to actually recover. You're not going hard enough to to really push your threshold efforts and 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 try and uh, bring the power output. Um, up in terms of what you're capable of doing over over that threshold um if you move your threshold obviously your iron man pace is going to move with that and and get be, be become uh you're going to become a faster faster bike rider so i think what what we need to do is just make that distinction go slow enough 
uh, when you're recovering and when you're riding your, your base miles for it to be at a comfortable pace, that level two kind of intensity and be very, very strict with that. And then uh, move yourself up into your uh, into your t- and do your threshold efforts and anything in between that is is basically no man's land because that's where your uh, race pace should end up for for an Ironman and it also does for for a bike rider um, and that usually does break your body down. So uh, spend twenty minutes odd um, every uh, you know a couple of times every ride that you're doing um, in in the in the threshold area. And then the rest of it in that sort of medium, um, uh, sort of lower intensity, around about level two. Right. And so, yeah, just one quick follow up on that. So when you mentioned that level two, if we use a power meter, what what sort of power ranges as percentage of FTP are we talking about there? Um, so percentage of FTP, um, round about the 60. Uh, yeah, 60 percent, I'd say um, that's that's uh, I think it's a good, good level. Yeah, and and that's uh, kind of important to to point out that it's still it's pretty easy to go easier than that and and get into uh, like way easier than that actually if you just sit on your bike as you say and uh, and yeah. uh, ride with your mates and uh, and sit in the, with the pack and and not really pushing yourself at all so so even though you're going easy and not not falling into that no man's land make make sure that you're not just sitting there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if we we can we can give it a, a a bit of a pure number, really. So if you're roughly if your threshold is around about two hundred and eighty watts, um, which I think is 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 a fairly n- common number, really, um, then then your your level two will be somewhere around about uh, one hundred and sixty to two hundred and twenty watts, roughly. Um, that that you should end up spending that that sort of base time on. Yeah, yeah. And and then as he said again on the quality workouts and the quality segments of workouts pushing pushing further up closer towards that threshold and, and avoiding the no man's land in in between. What about if you're time constrained and you don't really train a lot? Do you, do you have a lot of athletes that have really uh strict schedules and maybe they only ride twice per week? How how do you do that because you can't really do volume on on that time um, budget? Yeah, I I tend to do I tend to have quite a few of those coming in and and uh, wanting coaching and bo- both in time trialing and 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 Ironman triathlons and and so on. Um, the best way forward, as far as, far as I'm concerned, is is doing these sort of. Um, if you only can do an hour on the turbo trainer, then uh, four times twelve minutes at um, at at your threshold with. Uh, a couple of minutes rest in between tends to be a very very good workout and 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 actually uh, bring you forward um quite dramatically but then obviously if you are going to do a longer longer distance race you do need at some point to get those bigger hours in so um if you're struggling for struggling for time during the week then cram in a lot of the threshold work and intensity work uh, during the week and then less so during the uh, during the weekend and just get some some proper mileage done but um at that very very strict zone two kind of effort then yeah and i know that you're a big proponent of uh, power meters just just how important do you think that they are for for triathletes um i think uh, they are important for for any cycling if you're really and and probably even more so if you're time constrained because the more um precise you can be with your efforts the more uh, you can actually get out of yourself um, in in the very limited time that you might have available. Uh, the better it's going to be for you. And of course, a, a professional athlete will will use it because it's a it's a performance tool that's going to get the, that last sort of uh, half a percent to a, you know and and maybe even less so out of them. Um, and also, uh, for, in terms of pacing, it is so much easier to pace yourself with a power meter than it is with uh, heart rate, for instance, because by the time we get start moving around in the world um you travel you you then get to a hotter place than than what you might have been training in your heart rate doesn't respond quite as as uh, as as it used to do um during training and at that point you find yourself going too hard going too easy uh, and so on and uh, whereas one watt is always going to be one watt regardless of whether it's minus five or or, or plus 40 degrees outside um and whether you're tired or not tired it's it's always that constant number um so so get yourself i think a, a good solid power meter that does read um very accurately and, and very reliably uh, and and you're in a good position going forward 
I do agree. Uh, but that said, I know that there are a lot of people that are maybe maybe a bit newer to the sport and and it's uh, not necessarily the right time yet for them to invest because they, uh, well, it's an expensive sport and there's a lot of investments yeah. to be made anyway. So if you don't have a power meter, there are a lot of athletes that uh, usually have, have heart rate monitors. So GPS watch and heart rate seems to be something that comes by default on athletes these days. Uh, so can you get by on heart rate? How Do you use heart rate a lot in in, in your training analysis when you when you look at your athletes training um of course you can get by on on heart rate um i i tend to the, mo- the majority of the of the athletes that i coach have got power meters on their on their bikes and uh but we still always use the heart rate as a backup tool uh should the the, the power meter start playing up which uh, unfortunately these days there are too many that kind of go a little bit uh, off course um, then we always have the, the the heart rate data as a backup tool to to kind of make sure that that um, we're still doing the right things. Um, you know, any any tool that you can use that that makes your training quantifiable is always going to be better than than going on pure feel because you know saying you've got to go at eighty percent of perceived maximum effort that's a very sort of abstract uh, number and 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 kind of a very difficult to pinpoint that where you know where is my maximum how hard am i actually going at this point because your 80 percent of maximum at the start of a ride will be completely different um in compared to your 80 percent uh when you when you're actually tired uh certainly if, if you're going by perceived effort so um yeah i mean getting that 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 heart rate is is definitely a very very good tool to work with uh and especially if you do know the athlete and the the athlete has been recording heart rate for some time then um then you can you can work with the variables that that it brings into uh into the athlete's life so so how can you do you see a lot of different heart rate responses compared to the power output of the athletes because that's something that i know that i see that sometimes it the heart rate can seem very high compared to the power and sometimes very low with different athletes and and it kind of describes their athletic profile so to say is that something that people can even maybe use to to get their own profile analyzed themselves if they are self-coached for example yeah, you can, you can you can always do that, and and like you said, the the every every athlete is different, every person is different. So if you can profile yourself based on on your power and and heart rate and um, and work that out, then then that's gonna obviously help you very uh, an awful lot. It'll also tell you um, well, we can we can profile how what kind of um, cadence you should ride at what's your optimum kind of working level in terms of intensity um with the cadence um not every athlete is going to be able to ride the pedal like like chris Froome does up a up a hill you know some riders are actually more efficient going on the lower cadence and powering along um than they are to to try and spin the bike so um there's so many things that we can that we can work on with uh with all of these different uh different tools that we have available so um yeah i think i think you're right every every athlete is is um is definitely very different in in that aspect and the variables of of um uh, heart rate as well when when we start looking at what time of the day does an athlete train uh is it, it are they an early riser what is the heart rate doing at the at the at the first part of the day certainly if they get up and train in the sort of very very early morning some i've got some athletes that are up at sort of four thirty five o'clock in the morning and they're on the bike training at that point um the heart rate does respond differently to when you come back home after a long day at work and you might be tired and you've just eaten on the way back home uh, or even just before you when you get back home you have dinner with your with your family and then you get on to the turbo trainer later on in the evening um every at all these points in in during the day your your athlete does um your heart rate does change so so we need to to be very very um aware of of what happens with with each athletes and and that can be sometimes the the the, the difficulty in in making sure that you um you know you understand the athlete in in, uh, as such yeah absolutely and actually as a personal anecdote i'm at the moment really uh struggling to to try to def- figure out why my maximum heart rate seems to have risen by at least 10 or 15 beats per minute since moving to Portugal from Finland and and it hasn't really been my maximum heart rate has seen seemed to be 
maybe 185 in the past that has been the absolute maximum that i can get it up to but now i consistently get it up to the 190s 195 even and on some case and it's not even spikes it just looks like a natural heart rate curve and i have no idea what's happened why that's happened uh, maybe some of it might be stress related in my previous life with uh, too much going on and uh, now kind of a, a bit less of that and more more stress relief but I don't think it explains 10 or 15 beats per minute. So uh, it's it's interesting. But yeah, definitely can be useful. And if, if in case any listener missed what uh, Maggie was saying about the cadence, then you can, what, what he meant was that you can try to see where your heart rate, where you're less strained. So your heart rate is a bit lower. And, yep. and if that is where you are more efficient at that cadence and when you try to compare different cadences, but at the same power output. So let's move on to, you have a, a very distinguished road cycling career, as we've uh, touched upon a bit. You've uh, won stages at the Tour de France uh, and the, the Giro, and you've won the entire P- uh, Paris-Roubaix in, uh, when was it? 2004, I believe? 2004, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of really great merits there. Is there anything from your road cycling career that has had an influence on the way that you coach uh, triathletes or time trialists these days and do you use any training methods from those days that may seem unconventional to this audience of mostly triathletes um i don't know if it's uh if it's anything that's unconventional really that that i use obviously i've i've taken uh, snippets from every coach that i've ever worked with um my own experiences and and so on and so on and obviously listening to people around me as well so it's a, it's a constant sort of evolving um mechanism in terms of what i do as a as a, as a coach and and um you know watching talking to the even current professional bike riders and seeing what they're doing how's the racing changed um what do we need to do to uh to prepare um an athlete for that level of racing uh, and and you can take all that and move that uh, along down the road to uh, certainly to time trialing and shorter time trials is very very much unconventional that that I do when or have taken with me from um, from my time as a as a, as a, cy- a cyclist obviously uh, I've listened to every single coach I've taken snippets that have always worked to, that's worked well for me um, and but I also speak to a lot of sort of professional athletes today cyclists triathletes and and try and understand what the current sort of um scene is like how it, has it changed anything since i was in the middle of the action and and what is what is required from an athlete in 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 today's terms and then that definitely um can certainly when it comes to to, to cycling and time trialing i tend to be able to to move that into um, my coaching and use that in my coaching an awful lot whereas um the the, the, the sort of certainly the longer distance triathlons um, you got to make sure that that you're not doing too much top end training. So a certain amount you have to kind of do, but um, obviously cycling is a, is a completely uh, different type of sport. It's a sport where you're reacting to what other riders are doing on a, on a regular regular basis. Whereas um, uh, whereas Ironman triathlon and and even half Ironmans is more of a, a consistent pace and consistent sort of um effort that where you, you you're just pushing yourself all the time and you can control the effort that you're making to to a different uh level and um so yeah I, I i tend to sort of be very very reactive with uh with, with how i coach people and uh try and understand the athlete in in a very very deep on a very deep level uh and work with them on 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 the fact of what they're actually training for so that's uh yeah that's a brilliant segue actually let's uh, talk about a few different frameworks maybe if you want to call it that for uh, different types of athletes so if you have a beginner athlete that is training let's say two times per week on on the bike that is for a shorter race like a sprint or olympic how how would you use those those two rides per week what what kind of training should that athlete maybe do well, I I would still work on the uh, on the th- on one session on of uh, of threshold effort, um, and and just make sure that you get in that that sort of uh, base um, 
work uh, work at um, up as high as you can. So the, obviously the, the the less of an impact uh, a high pace has on your body, the better it's going to be both for uh, for the cycling and also obviously when you're getting onto the run. So to have a high FTP is, is always going to to make your life an awful lot easier. So I would I would put them down to work on on that on one session and then going into um, some more sprint related kind of efforts. Certainly if we're lo- looking at the sprint and uh, Olympic distance um, e- events, uh, every time you're going through a corner, um, you, you need to sort of get out of the saddle, accel- accelerate. And if that takes an awful lot out of, out of your body, then you're going to really struggle by the time you get into the end of that bike riding and get on your feet and start running. So, um, yeah, a bit of sprint and and top end efforts with some some threshold efforts on the other session. And what about an athlete that's training, let's say, three times per week on the bike and that they're going to do their first Ironman? Uh, if we're looking at an Ironman effort, then I would definitely go uh, slightly longer efforts and spend a lot more time based on on your uh, functional threshold um and and working on that so depending on how many hours they they have available to ride on those three days uh, i would still put um as many which was, well maybe not as many but certainly a, a good couple of 20 minute efforts into every ride that they're doing um and then have one day then where they're just doing the bigger mileage um and and just getting that zone to ride in um and and yeah building on, on time on the bike basically and uh if you're training your more intermediate advanced so you're no longer training for your first iron man you're training three or maybe even four times per week but it's still an iron man that's your goal race how does does it change the type of training that you do it doesn't really change an awful lot to be honest with you it uh it just makes it more you do more of the same um and and you put keep on pushing um what i would probably build in if you're to start this, we're talking a an intermediate to advanced athlete who's now actually racing an ironman um and really pushing the times it's just building some v, uh, one session of of vo2 efforts where um that they're really pushing the the, the envelope and, and getting into some top end stuff just to be able to 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 help the FTP to rise, because um, I find on on a lot of athletes you can train your FTP and train and train and train and train it, and it kind of uh, levels out at one particular plateau. And unless you move the the VO two up a, a notch, um, there's no not really any room for the the FTP to move along with it. So um, I, I would definitely throw in uh, a session of of some VO two stuff. Yeah, raising the ceiling. Uh, fi- finally, the final profile that I want to ask about, somewhat selfishly, because this is uh, <laughs> my profile, uh, an advanced athlete training uh, four times per week on the bike for draft legal sprint and Olympic races. Yeah. Um, I think we need to look at... Um, mo- if, if it's draft legal races, then then we're looking at more actual road racing on the bike. Um, it becomes more bunch, um, bunch sort of related racing. Um, we've got to train a lot of top end, a lot of VO2 efforts to um, to make sure that you can react to the changes in pace, the change, the jumping out of the corners, and uh, and also actually build, build in some s- certain amount of technical drills um, to make sure that you uh, are capable. Uh, there's so many th- times that I you, you as a as a cyclist can go through a corner. And if you're technically better than the rider in front of you, you're only putting half of the effort into, um, you know, going out of the corner, exiting the corner, and getting on to up to up to speed again, because you know the lines, you can you can handle the bike well, and and so on and so on. So, uh, technical drills is something that I think is overseen an awful lot, and probably even more so in in triathlon um than it is in 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 cycling so yeah i'd say find find that um uh, industrial area where where you know on on an evening where you haven't got any cars going around and you can find a, a tight technical circuit and go through the corners try different lines through corners uh, and work out how you can actually improve your te- your your technique and uh I, I bet you, you know, even actually looking at uh, some bike races where where you can you can pick up a, a thing or two from from the guys that do it, you know, are the best guys in the world at it. Um, so yeah, and then obviously uh, at least one session then where you're really focusing on that uh, strength and um, and VO2 stuff. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. That technical stuff is definitely something that I've overlooked, <laughs> but uh, I, I definitely see, you, see, you're, see you're your not, point. You're, <laughs> you're not alone on that one, I can tell you. But uh, you'd be amazed if you if you can find even a a local criterium, um, you know, or a local sort of league of races where you can go and actually do some some road racing. Um, it doesn't have to be. It can be sort of shorter style can mess races or uh, circuit races, whatever it is that you can find where you're jumping in with cyclists and you're starting to have the corner with cyclists and you'll very very quickly understand the different lines that that some of those guys are taking and by the time you're coming out of a corner and you're gapped 15 20 meters every time you also work out what you have to do to be on the wheel of the rider in front of you coming out of that turn so you don't have to take um, the wind as much uh, whilst you're trying to accelerate the bike so um, I, I would say try and get into and to, if you're doing draft legal racing, it is it is basically road racing on the on a bike, and uh, the best guys to do that are the the, the guys that that do it every day of the week. Yeah. So I want to go into your own Ironman racing because you started hmm. doing Ironmans and then you qualified for Kona as an age grouper within, was it six months of starting yeah. triathlon? Yeah, yeah, it was, what, yeah. What was your ability uh, or inability <laughs> at the start <laughs> on the swim and run? Well, the swim and run, um, swimming was definitely something that I've never done in anger before. Um, you know, I, I could swim, but I was, I've never really looked at it as a competitive form of you know a, a sport really so um i kind of had a bit of a, an assessment with um with a friend of mine who uh, used to be a very good swimmer and uh, and also was a coach in, in triathlon back in the day and um we went down to the local pool jumped in the water um i think i paddled around at about a minute and 50 for the 100 meters which um we thought okay that's we got something to work with there we can we can get that down to a half tidy um you know swimming time um and with the run it was more a question actually of getting my knees and joints to take the impact after having spent the better part of 20 years um not taking any like basically trying to be off my feet as much as i could to be uh allow my, my muscles to recover for in in terms of cycling so it took me the better part of two months to actually get to the point where I ran 10 kilometers without actually having uh, any any physical problems um, mm. after. So it was very much a reactive kind of running coaching uh, that we had to do. Um, I also went and looked at uh, how can I run in the most efficient way possible to not um, damage my joints. Um, and and, and what, to, to what was that? That's, that's interesting. So, so how did you do that? So um, I, I started analyzing a lot of stuff on um, looking at YouTube, what's out there, what, how do people, what, what, what are the best, best runners in the world? Um, you obviously go and look at the guys like Mo Farah and, and all the, the rest of the, 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 the marathon runners. How do they run? What do they do that, we, that I didn't do? Um, learning obviously very, very quickly then that um, I was heel striking and that's clearly not a very good thing for your joints. Um, and certainly with the weight that I... Uh, perform at as well it was it was very very heavy on my body so i had to learn to mid to, to mid foot strike or even to a certain extent toe strike to um to to get that um sort of to lessen the impact on my on my body and as soon as i was able to do that i was able to up the mileage quite a lot as well so i probably spent a better part of a, a month and a half just trying to sort of learn to um not stride out in front of my body but actually pushing off um, backwards a lot more and kind of falling into the stride a lot uh, and that was very very strange obviously because as a cyclist my hip flexors are somewhat tight so it meant having to go and and look at physios uh, what can we do with this how can we how can we um, sort my body out so I can actually do this in an efficient way um, and yeah it took me the better part of um, yeah, uh, I, my first ever marathon was actually my first triathlon, which I did up in Sweden in Kalmar. Um, I had not run a full full marathon before that. It was only up to about half marathon distance. Um, yeah. So, so that was it. Was it's so certainly very very interesting to to say the least. Do Do you have anything else that uh, those are already a couple of points, like especially with the running, but any, anything that you consider 
big levers in uh, getting you quickly to a to a high level that uh, that the listeners of this show that may be new to running or swimming uh, or newish to any of these disciplines that that you found helped you a lot when it uh, came to improving your ability in those sports um the swimming is only there's only one way forward really and that's find a very 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 good swim coach straight away um i was very fortunate to work with uh, paul newsom at um swim smooth oh wow um ended up um yeah through through who was my wetsuit sponsor at the time uh ended up in the pool together with paul uh he was teaching a whole load of guys here in the uk his uh, or basically coaching those coaches um uh, in the swim smooth, smooth techniques and he was able to uh well i was fortunate enough to be in the water and be completely picked apart in my in terms of my swim uh, swim stroke so i went from swimming at the time about a minute 40 odd um per, per, per 100 meters um to the point where i could barely float after they picked me apart completely and then um put my swim stroke back together again and um all of a sudden i was down to about a 125 per, per 100 for um for quite some time so I was very lucky to have that that um, a sort of a, a opportunity, but with that, I also, you know, really very quickly realised that if you're going to do something well, you research who the best coaches in your area are at teaching these kind of things, and and you go and see them. Um, it's the same as you know, if you've got to ride a bike fast, there is you go and speak to the guys who knows how who know how to ride the bike, and uh, it's it's just quite quite straightforward, really. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Uh, so I have a couple of more short questions. Let's take these really quickly. But there are a couple of listener questions that came in uh, just the other night. And the first one is, uh, do you have an opinion on the potential benefits of oval chain rings? Um, I've tried every single type of oval chain ring there is. Um, if some of them does do feel like they actually give you a bit of help. Um whether they do or not is still something that we cannot really 100% understand. Um, I guess if it feels like it it works for you, then it probably does work for you. Um, but like I said, there isn't really, it's so difficult to quantify with the power meters because the power meters kind of read, they think that we, 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 we're we pedaling with a round chain ring, that the tangential force is is, is always constant, which, um, you know, with, with an oval chain ring, they aren't. Um, my of my own personal um, opinion, if you are going to go oval, then you need to go extremely oval for it to really have any kind of uh, proper benefit. So we're talking twenty five percent ovalization or more to to really get the uh, get get the, the the proper benefits from having the oval chain rings. Um, that that that's just the way I've tested it, and I said I, I I've tried every oval square whatever you can you can possibly um throw at me just to kind of understand whether i actually rode any faster or not yeah yeah and the other question that came in is uh, this one is from from dan and uh, he talked about marginal aero gains and do you have any any tips for that that you use and encourage your athletes to to do to get those marginal gains like he mentions for example waxed chains uh, oversized pulley wheels overshoes aero socks and so on um at this point in time um if you're going to look for 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 the the, the over, overcharged pulley wheels and and go down that whole route and get the marginal gains of that one i'm expecting that he's probably spent the better part of a week in the wind tunnel already because that's probably where you're going to get them the the, the biggest gains or go and see someone who can, who really understands um aerodynamics and and the position on the bike because let's face it you can you can change all the um all the bits and pieces on your bike to make that little bit more aerodynamic but at the end of the day it's the guy on top of the bike that has got the biggest drag factor and um with with that there's so many guys that i see that still haven't got a good position on the bike both in terms of putting the power out but also in terms of what they do um with the frontal area and uh, and even now, to a certain extent, there's so many people starting to work on the frontal area, but forget about what happens further down the line. So get a, get you know, like I said, go and see someone who really understands the aerodynamics on on the on the bike, and uh, and and work with those guys. And um, you know, if you have a really really good bike fitter as well, they 
they will understand what to do with a with a time trial bike to get you uh, as fast and as slippery as possible in the wind and get the numbers out at the same time yeah that's an, an important message to get across we've had quite a few episodes on on that topic and 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 it's the same every every time that really the guy sitting on on the bike is is uh, the the reason for most of the the drag and that's what you need to spend all of your work on until you have optimized that really yeah i mean we, we've done a quite a bit of work on that in over the last uh last six months now since i started doing doing bike fits and stuff myself and and uh I mean, we've had guys come in and I've, I've managed to shave, you know, the better part of 10, 12 minutes off their Ironman times on, on a bike just by putting them in, a, in an aerodynamic position where um, they actually can put the uh, put the numbers out. So uh, there's so many, so many riders and athletes still getting it, getting it wrong and uh, just going super low in the front and think they're aero and, and all of a sudden they, they don't understand why their FTP on the time trial bike is... 40 50 watts lower than what it is on their road bike um and and why they all of a sudden go slower on that so um get yourself down to the to, to a good bike fitter and uh and speak to them and i'm sure they can help out to get uh you know get you fitted properly yeah good good advice and and as i said uh chris the listener that uh that to- told me about you he he has uh as I understand, also gotten a bike fit from you. Is that correct? And anyway, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. So he's been heaping praise on you. So if you live in your area of uh, the United Kingdom, where where is it that you're located? I'm uh, based down in Newport. Uh, that's where I got my fit studio. So um, yeah, if 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 you want to get in touch, then just look it up on on backsteadbikefit.com and uh, get in touch, and we can certainly help you uh, improve your position on the bike. Brilliant. All right, let's move into the rapid fire questions and uh, let's uh, keep this really short, 15 seconds or so. And uh, let's start with what's your favorite book, blog or resource related to triathlon or cycling? Oh, good question. Um, I tend to be still very much on cycling news for cycling. Um, Triathlon, various different ones. What's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Uh, stubbornness and um, never stop looking for that next thing that's going to help me improve Um, always 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 sort of look for uh, the next level so you never you're never sort of happy with where you're at there's always a way to to improve yourself nothing is ever perfect yeah, I think what you mentioned there earlier about your how you progressed in in your Ironman career that is a great example. Like studying Mofar on YouTube and seeking out Paul Newsom for swim coaching. So that's that's a good takeaway. And finally, what do you wish you had known or wish you had done differently at some point in your career? Being a bit more patient with uh, when as a cyclist when I was injured and not wanting to come back. Uh, to the highest level as quickly as I as I probably did. There's a number of times where I, you know, rushed back from an injury without doing the rehab and and taking the time to actually get myself up to fitness level again. But just kind of half jobbing it and getting onto a bike and and racing again as soon as I possibly could. I reckon I would have been racing up until about a couple of years ago if uh, if I'd been doing things smart. Mm. Okay, so uh, Magnus, this has been really, really fantastic to have a chat with you. I really learned a lot and uh, appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, if the listeners want to learn more about you, your website is on uh, bextetcoaching.com and uh, we'll have that in the show notes because it's a Swedish uh, name that's not even for Swedish-speaking people <laughs> like myself too easy to spell. So so it will be on the show notes on that triathlon show and in the episode description in your podcast app. And we'll also link to your Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I think those are your so- main social media accounts. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that you want to mention before we close off this interview? No, I'd just say thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's been great having a chat. So uh, look forward to uh, to uh, having your, your listeners come in with questions as well. Yeah, brilliant. It's been great fun. All right, people, this has been Magnus Beckstedt. It was uh, really great talking to you, Magnus. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. I really got a lot out of it. I think Magnus dropped a ton of value bumps on us there. 
There really are a lot of important takeaways, but if I have to pick a couple that stood out the most to me, they would be first doing threshold training and how effective that is for raising your cycling ability. And second, something we hear about a lot on this podcast, but it bears repeating. So many triathletes do way too much moderate intensity training, no man's land training. And I know that you know that already. You've heard that a lot of times. Many of you, most of you know that at l- But do you follow it? You can always go and check your training log and see if you're actually adhering to the advice. Uh, But another takeaway here related to this is not to let it spill over on the other side either and get into just sitting and chilling on your bike. Like, well, you can maybe chill a little bit, but not too much. That level 2, zone 2 training is still, when you go at it for a long time, it's, it's still... It still works. It's not just just sitting there and smelling the roses all the time. So... That's my main takeaway probably, to stay out of that no man's land, but also, as Magnus said, trying to be uh, particular about getting into into that zone 2 or level 2, whatever you want to call it. And what do you think were the most important take-home messages? I would really like it if you could go to thattriathlonshow.com and click through to the show notes that you can find there as usual and post in the comments on those show notes and we can have a discussion about it on that blog post or that show notes post and, uh, and keep that discussion open for everybody to see. So that's something that I'm trying to get more into and I really think that it could be useful for a lot of the listeners. Obviously, the show notes will also have all the details from this episode as usual, so if there's anything you want to check, you can go and have a look at that on that show notes page. Again, that's thattriathlonshow.com. If you haven't already, I want to pick a few different related episodes that uh, on cycling training, I should say, that I think are my most recommended cycling-specific episodes when it comes to cycling training, I've, I haven't picked like aerodynamic episodes or things like that, but more when it comes to the training side of things, training and potentially racing a little bit. So here goes, here's my list of top picks for you to go and listen to next if you haven't. Cycling Science and Myth Busting Part 1 and 2 with Stephen Chung, those are episodes 74 and 75. Performance Training Tactics and Physiology of Cycling and Running in Triathlon, that was a mouthful, with Naroa Echebaria, that was episode 61, that was a really good one, really popular one. Then we have Structured Power-Based Cycling Training with Chad Timmerman, episode 38, Chad is head coach at Trainer Road, which many of you are probably using, so go and listen to that, Chad is really, really great and has a lot of influence on, he has had a lot of influence on on how I coach, uh, to be honest, so I really, really like his approach. And uh, finally, training zones part two, cycling. So these are cycling specific training zones, how to use them, what they are. You should definitely listen to this if you don't know this like the back of your hand. Episode 29, go and have a look at that. All of them can be found on thattriathlonshow.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, by the way, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already so you don't miss any episodes like these or others important ones in the future. Final call to action for today at the moment of recording, which is the 12th of December 2017. I sit at roughly 70 ratings and reviews for that triathlon show. And as I talked about before, I set myself the big goal of reaching 100 five-star ratings and reviews by the end of this year. Well, if you're listening to this episode, you know that we're coming up on the end of this year within just a few days. So if you have been getting value from this podcast during this year, please take a couple of minutes to go to iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever app you happen to be using and give the show an honest rating and review. This goal isn't just for show. It really is an important one to me. I need to prove to myself that all the work that I put into it is worth it and that it has an impact. So I'd be so, so happy if you could help me out in reaching this goal of getting 100 five-star ratings and reviews. But as I said, you don't need to... Give make it an honest rating and review because I want your honest feedback. And finally, thank you again to Precision Hydration for sponsoring this episode. Remember to take their free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com to get your personalized hydration strategy for your next race. And use the discount code that triathlon show, all one word, for 15% off. Thank you as always for listening. I highly, highly appreciate you and you listening in every Monday and Thursday. 
subscribe so that you don't miss any of those Monday University episodes, as I told you. And in the meantime, keep training smart and keep loving triathlon. <laughs>